<laughs> there we go. So we're recording now. So this is Mark, lesson one. And like I was saying before we started recording, it is such a joy to uh, uh, to meet everybody, to see everybody, uh, to realize we have people literally from all over the world that gather together like this. And through the years, we've had people uh, from, uh, I mean, everywhere, India, Macau, Hong Kong. We actually had for a season, we had a young lady who was a student here from China. And uh, she wanted her friends to experience all this, but China blocks YouTube. And so uh, since we're recording, I won't tell you what we did, but we came up with a workaround with that. And her friends were able to gather together. And I just think that's the most exciting thing. So what I want to do is I want to pray for us. But first of all, I want you to think about something. As we pray, I want you to determine to really, really press on in this because I can guarantee you, okay, I can guarantee you that you're going to meet some resistance now that you've decided you want to gather together and study the word of God. There will be some things that will come your way. Sometimes it's just logistical things of life. Okay. Uh, other times it's more serious things, but just determine the press on and to really encourage one another, really exhort one another in this. Okay. That, you know, that we're going to press on. It's a nine week study. I think something like that, because there is so much to be gleaned. You're not going to believe what we're going to see tonight. I mean, it's just so much in here that, uh, that we're going to see. And we're just basically doing an overview of things. A lot of times people will say that the precept stuff goes into a lot of depth. You can go a lot deeper if you want to. And that's the, the joy of it all. But really, really uh, determine that you're going to do that. And then also encourage one another. Uh, so I'm going to use Randall as an example because he's from over in Atlanta. So he understands life. right? And so, Randall, if you've got a question about something, you're looking at it. I don't think you have to wait till next week to come yeah. to class to ask the question. Shoot the question over to somebody. Shoot it over to Rachel. She knows everything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. She writes books. She writes books. There you go. Okay. She is a fount of wisdom. She really is. I mean, I, just amazing what God speaks to her. But uh, really, the, the whole point is that we want to know the truth. We receive the truth through the word of God, through the spirit of God, and through the body of Christ and us functioning together. And so I really encourage you to do that because I think you'll have more uh, insight, develop relationships with his kingdom all over the world. Um I also sort of view uh, this time together in a little different kind of way. We're not here to work a lesson. You know, the thing that we do during the week, the homework and all that kind of stuff, that's just a common experience that we have. Some weeks we'll be very successful in it. Other weeks, it's just, I'm glad that I'm able to make it here. You know what I mean? That's all right. It's because the general direction is that we keep pressing on and pressing on. And so we all have a common experience in studying the word. And then we gather together, not so much to say, well, what did you get the answer for this and answer for this? No, no, no. To talk about what the Lord is saying, you know, what's going on. If there needs to be a directed answer to something, throw it out there. Definitely make sure you do that. Okay. But the idea is this, that we're just gathering together. Lord, what are you saying to us? Then also one little, uh, oh, hang on a second. Gotta let somebody in. Uh, Zoom started doing this to where you have to manually let people in. You can't do it automatically anymore. Um, and it, it makes a sound, but sometimes somebody won't shut up. And they can't hear the sound. You know? So <laughs> anyway, if that happens, just wait. I'll eventually see you. Also, uh, if you have a question, you can put it over in the chat. Right now, I'm sharing my screen, and that's probably not your chat. So if you try to click in a chat right there, that's because that's mine. But find your chat and pop it out. Sometimes people will overlay it or just put it on the side or something like that. And uh, but just, you can ask questions like that. And then also, if you look down in the chat there where it says everyone, you can click right next to it on that little carrot and you see everybody listed by name right there. And so you'll see Randall Stanley there. I can click on Randall Stanley and send him a chat and he and I can chat privately and nobody will know it. It's legalized talking behind the teacher's back. And you can do it. You have permission to do that. So you can just do that all you want to, because the most important thing is that we learn what the Lord is saying and that we function together as his body. So anyway, we'll, we'll keep discovering things. And if you have questions about stuff, put it over in the chat and we'll deal with it as we go along. OK, so, Father, I thank you for gathering us together today. And uh, Lord, really the joy of your body and Lord, the joy of your body coming together and, and new friends uh, within the kingdom of God. Uh, and that you bringing us together for such a time as this, 
Lord, we know this is not by happenstance. We know that this isn't by any design of man. We know that from the, before the foundations of the earth, that you knew that we would be gathering together like that. And Lord, we thank you for that and just praise you for that. And just ask now, Lord, that you do what you desire to do. Lord, that you teach us, that you give us understanding uh, through your word, through your spirit, through one another. And that, Father, above all things, that you would be glorified. I thank you, Lord, for the time that we had this week and looking in uh, this first chapter. And I pray, Lord, that you will now just speak to us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So has anybody got any questions <clears throat> after I rattle through all that <laughs> about anything? <clears throat> Speak now or forever hold your peace, right? <clears throat> so I want to ask y'all a question from the very beginning right here. Uh, this first chapter of Mark is loaded. M my goodness, there's so many things in here, so much going on. Um, so is, is this is reading the gospel like this, is this just something that's a historical narrative? Is it a story that we are to know because we would all profess to be believers? Or is this something that really has something to do with us? Is this something that is supposed to be more impactful than uh, just uh, a narrative? What do y'all think? Oh, look what Rachel said over in the chat. She said, it is full of immediately this and immediately of that. Then this happens. Then this happens. I think that word, that Greek word for immediately appears like 42 times in the thing. And I think it's 10 times in the first chapter. So yeah, Randall, were you going to say something? You, you better watch no, it. This I'm, just, I'm just following along, listening, shaking okay. my head. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, this is like an auction, man. If I think you got something to say, it, okay, I'll call if I, if I go, okay. <laughs> I don't need if one you, of the little cards. If you move wrong, you just bought it, man. <laughs> okay, okay. I better watch myself. <laughs> no, let me tell you. Once you get to know one another, I did it with the previous mm -hmm. class. You got several good friends. Like Rachel's got her video off right now. But uh, like Rachel and Laura, they do not have poker faces. And so uh, I'll say something. And Laura did while I go, and I went, Laura, you started to open your mouth to say something. She said, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, uh, the reason I asked that question is, I think there's a lot more here than a lot of times uh, that we allow ourselves to see and allow the Lord to reveal to us. I, I'm always reminded of what Jesus said on the 14th chapter of John, uh, what, the 12th verse. Remember where he says, you know, truly, truly, I say to you that the one who believes in me, the works that I do, you'll do those works also, but even greater works than these will I do because I go to the father. Did Jesus really mean that? <laughs> Does he really mean that the works that he did? Because uh, what were some of the works that you saw in the first chapter of Mark that he did? Rachel says well, healing. Well, he was casting out demons. Casting out demons. <clears throat> Hang on a second. Oh, we have somebody new. Is this Terry? Hey, let me, let me. Oh, uh, you need to unmute yourself there, Terry. I'm sorry. Okay. There you go. Now we can hear you. Great. Nice Hello, to meet you. everyone. Hey, hey, tell us real quick, where are you from? Um, I'm in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma. Great. Great. It's nice to meet you. So uh, Rachel said healing. Randall, what'd you say? Casting out demons. Oh, or casting spirits. out demons. Yeah. Casting, casting out unclean spirits, ca mm -hmm. casting out demons. Yeah. And so when I read this stuff, I have this John thing in my mind all the way through. And I'm going, Lord, you did these things. And so often for a huge portion of my life, I've thought, well, that's just Jesus doing that thing. But Lord, are you calling us as the body of Christ to be doing some things? And I think this is some stuff we need to sort of pay attention to. But let's go back to the very beginning. Tell me, how does Mark start at the very beginning? First chapter, the first verse. Rachel says, we don't recognize the evil spirits thing in our society. Why is that, Rachel? <laughs> and Rachel's going, do we want to go around this rabbit hole right now? We may. <laughs> A lot of times we don't want to do any of what we call that supernatural stuff. And even that term is so limiting, is it not? And we don't see it. We think we don't see it. But even the world acknowledges it and doesn't know it. We call it other things, diseases or a condition. Or the world will say this. How many times have we said this? I don't know what came over them. <laughs> well, I wonder what it was that came over them, you know? And, you know, we'll acknowledge it that way, 
but we don't want to see and we don't want to believe. And I think that has happened to our detriment. So what I often will do is this right here, guys. I will throw this up. Let me pull it up right here. Can y'all see that right there? Yes. And that's just a scripture. Now, it covers up all of our lovely faces, but that's okay, right? And a lot of times what I do, this is a piece. Oh, I, I didn't tell you all that. I'm sorry. This is a piece of free software. One more housekeeping thing. Forgive me for this, but let me go back and do this if I can find it. Uh, okay, y'all hang on a second. It's about to get weird. Ready? Did that just get weird on you? Uh, oh, I'll just go here. How many of y'all use a Mac? I do. There you go. Uh, I was going to show you this. This is my website right here. Okay. It's just my name, dalemore.tv. This is me and my wife when I was in a far less hairier situation in life. Okay. And uh, so this is the front page. I'm going to show you. I'm showing this. Uh, I do a, a daily blog, by the way. Uh, right here's the blog. It'll finish loading up. There it is. And I do a little, here's the blog. I do a podcast. There's the podcast. And here's the blog. But in the upper right-hand corner, this is a little menu. If you click on that menu, right here, it says Bible studies. And if you'll scroll down, here's the different things with Bible studies we've done through the years. Right here, it says Mark Resources. And if you click on right there, this is stuff that uh, when you're doing homework, but it says, uh, hey, you know, if you've got a commentary, you can click this first one right here. It will take you the rest mm -hmm. of this year. And I'm not kidding you just to read the resources related to Mark right here. This one right here is far more accessible. This right here is a, a Bible software that's free. And then if you want somebody to read Mark to you, I do this a lot. I just turn it on and have the word just read to me. You know, this video is very cool. You need to check that out. Mark being read as a video. Uh, this eSword computer software right here is what I'm using right now. And it's totally free, okay? Uh, this book right here, I, some of y'all may know who Michael Card is, the Christian singer and artist. He's a great teacher and a great writer. He's written a great book, a commentary on Mark. I'm reading that right now. So anyway, uh, sorry for the advertisement, but that's what this software is right here. So this is totally free. And right here in this column is the King James. And here's the New American Standard, which uh, a lot of us may be using right now. Here's the ESV, which others may be using. And here's one called Lexum. Yeah, Rachel says the Blue Letter Bible. She uses this when she's looking up the Greek meaning. Yeah, it's totally free. It's online. And all these things have phone apps and everything. It's just amazing, you know. And sometimes I wonder, God, how accountable are you going to hold us since we have all these tools now? You know what I mean? Since we have all these phenomenal resources. So look how he's, Mark starts this thing. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What do we learn from the very beginning here, guys? What do we learn? He's the son of God. He's the son of God. Right? Yeah, Rachel says right out of the gate that Jesus is the son of God. And he calls it the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Good news. It, it means good news. And what's really interesting is it was used in the Greek, uh, euangelion, it was used uh, as a proclamation when they had a new king or a new emperor, a new Rome. The good news, the good proclamation. Uh, it has uh, overt religious connotations now in all of our societies, the gospel, but it's a proclamation of good news. And Mark's the only gospel that uses that term right there, like that, that proclaims that. And, you know, usually in these classes right here, we spend a lot of time at the very beginning talking about the whole book and who wrote it and all that. <clears throat> Not this time. We just sort of jump into it. Mark, John Mark, was likely uh, the right-hand uh, translator for Peter. Peter calls him his son. He refers to him like that. And Mark gives his gospel account. He wasn't walking with Jesus when he was here on earth, though I think he was with him in the last days. And we'll see that at the end of Mark. There's a little hint right there of that. We'll look at that later on. But he was with Peter according to a lot of resources. The Apostle John seems to have said something like that, and a guy named Papias mentions this, that, uh, that he was with Peter and that he had all of Peter's stories, and Peter wrote, uh, gave, uh, told him the stories, and Mark wrote them down. The first thing that Mark says is what? Let me tell you the, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, 
the son of God. I mean, from the very beginning. And then he goes where in the next couple of verses? Old Testament. He goes to the Old Testament. Yeah, he goes to what part of the Old Testament? Isaiah. Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah. Isaiah. Uh, well, and then it's actually Isaiah and part yeah, of Malachi. Malachi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt, you caught that, huh? Malachi too. And so he sort of conflates it together. As, I tell you what, it's one of the more interesting things just to pay attention to uh, as we're just doing all these studies and things is how the New Testament uses the Old Testament, how the Spirit of the Lord used the writers of the New Testament uh, to take the Old Testament, uh, either the Hebrew or the Aramaic or quite often the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, because that's what they would have had for the most part would have been Septuagint and takes those things and how they use those things. I mean, it's one of the most interesting, intriguing things. And we have a great example of it right here. So what does it say? As it is written, Isaiah, the prophet, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, Mark is writing uh, primarily to a Gentile audience. And he's writing to those we think in Rome that are really undergoing a lot of persecution. And so it sort of helps know that thing. You don't see Mark spending as much time talking about uh, Jewish things and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times he uh, has to give them understanding what a particular Jewish word means. So that sort of lets you know that they're more of a Gentile kind of background. But here he proclaims an Old Testament scripture to them. Why does he do that? Why does he speak of this word of uh, Isaiah right here? Well, for me, it makes it more believable when you, I don't know his reason, but it helps us as an individual to believe. You know, and that's exactly what's going on because what he's doing is he's letting them know what's the next verse for John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness. So what is he tying together here? He's letting them know that that messenger, that that one is crying in the wilderness was John the Baptist. He's letting them know, and he's given a little bit of a history lesson right here. And now John, for the, I mean, Mark, for the most part, in the accounts that he gives, they're a little bit shorter. You know, the book is shorter. It's the shortest gospel. It's a little bit shorter of accounts, but it's amazing how much information he's the only one that gives. So, so is this what Kay would call giving context? Yes. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it was. Who had that brilliant insight? Was that? Well, it was <laughs> Terry. Oh, it, it was Terry that had that brilliant <laughs> insight. I don't know if it was brilliant. But, <laughs> but it was insight nonetheless, right? Yeah. No, that's exactly what it is. And it's actually uh, internal context right there because it's written within the letter, but it gives us so much insight and gives us hints as to what's going on. And that John the Baptist was the one who fulfilled uh, this prophecy. So look what we learned here, verse four. Well, let me just ask you, what did you learn about John the Baptist real quick? <laughs> Y'all talk to me while I drink some coffee. He was a forerunner. He was proclaiming Christ is come. He was the forerunner, the one that fulfilled this prophecy right here. Hey, how did he dress? Like a wild man. Like a wild man? <laughs> or like an Old Testament prophet? Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, very much. <laughs> wild man. And uh, where did he live? <laughs> Rachel says over the chat, he didn't eat a wide variety of food. <laughs> what did he eat? Honey and locusts. He ate honey and locusts. And, you know, I know, I, you know, you read the book. You like the honey part, Rachel. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, lots of people come along and say, well, it was really a seed from the carob tree. It wasn't the insect. No, it was the insect, guys. But people eat insects. I mean, you can buy it in stores, you know, roasted mm -hmm. stuff, roasted ants and things like that. So you take a little locust and you dip it in the honey right there and you're ready to rock and roll. There's a lot of protein in those things. It is. Yeah, there really is. And not necessarily my cup of tea, but that's all right. You know, <laughs> but he was, was he uh, an, a different character? Mm. Yeah, very, very different. And so least. what what did he do? He just comes out of the wilderness and starts doing what? Yelling. Yeah. 
did it say he was yelling? Well, you, you think that way. Uh, you sort of want to think that way, yeah. He wasn't whispering. John the Baptist, verse 4, appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. He was preaching and proclaiming, and he was proclaiming a baptism. Baptism for what? A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. He's saying, if you repent, come out here and be baptized. And you know what? In the Jewish mind, in the Jewish ear, this was a horrific thing because the Jews weren't baptized. The Jews would baptize the Gentiles into their belief, but they didn't do that kind of stuff. But it was a bapti baptism for repentance. Forgiveness but he was speaking to the Jews mainly. He was speaking to the Jews mainly. You better believe it. And it was in anticipation of the one coming. We see this right here. Let me get up here. Um, well, we'll get to it in a second. And all of the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sin. So it says all of Judea, all of Jerusalem. What does all mean? Mm -hmm. Everyone. Yeah, everyone, everyone, yeah. And so the idea is this, that all of them went. It's the greatest show in town, man. You got a wild man out here dressed like a prophet, you know, proclaimed to be repent. Yeah, Randall. So since that was, obviously that was not the way they, um, I mean, they dealt with sin then, right? It was sacrifices and all that. So how do you think it came about that all these people started going to John? Yeah, isn't that a great question? What do y'all think about that? It was different. Okay, it was different, a different show? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was intriguing. It was fascinating. It was different. It was... You'll always have that element with mankind, right? And, and how did the Jewish leaders look upon that? Well, <laughs> how do you think they looked upon it? Well, I, well, I know, but I was just... I, I mean, sucks. that's what I'm trying to say is obviously the Jewish leaders would not have... No, no. But, but how else how else would God introduce something new, right? The his his plan. Yeah. So what he right? did, he comes along because you were right. Uh, they're still under the old covenant. They're still under the law, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh he comes along and says, Hey, you 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 repent right here, you confess, baptize for your sin. They were used to if you sin, well, I'll go get a lamb, slice his throat right there. And there, there was nothing that had to do with the heart. It was just execution of a law right here. And it didn't mm -hmm. really bring forgiveness. It just atoned. It just covered for the sin, right? So it was like paying a fine? Yeah, it, very much so. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. But now he's saying, hey, you need to do this in anticipation. The Jewish leaders eventually showed up, and he looks at them and says, hey, you brood of vipers, who told you to come out here? That gives you an idea of what he thought of it, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, so don't don't you think that uh, that it was also the the leading of the Holy Spirit? I, I think do. that's a big thing. I think that the I do because yeah, there was God a calling them. There was a major messianic anticipation. Mm -hmm. There was a stirring among the people, a stirring, a stirring. Now Melanie brought up a great point. She said, "Wasn't the sacrifice for sins done only once a year?" For the for the nation and for the people, yeah, it was done once a year, uh, like that. Okay, it was only done at that time. For that. But for the individual, if somebody sinned, they had to do what? They had to go come in for the priest and offer a sacrifice. And the law was very precise in what they did. You know how much they did and stuff. And so, the, yeah, this was. Come uh, listen. I think very much a stirring. Of, come listen. Uh, yeah, come listen. <laughs> Hello, come listen. We, we got a cute couple in the first class. Uh, I used to go to church with him and he's online. He sits right here and she always sits over to the side where you can't see her and she'll stick her hand out and wave at us, you know, like that every now and then tonight, she actually moved into the field of vision. We can see what's going on with her. <laughs> so here you have this sort of wild man out there. He's dressed in the camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. His diet was locusts and wild honey and he's preaching and he's letting them know folks after me, Verse seven, one is coming who's mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. See, John was really the last Old Covenant, Old Testament prophet. You know, people say, well, Malachi was. Well, Malachi was the last one that, that was written down in that way. 
400 years later, now you've got John coming along proclaiming this and he's saying, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not even worthy to do this. But there's one who's coming who I can't even untie his sandals. What was John saying there? Particularly that I baptize with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What's that all about? Well, we know, but trying to think what they thought and how that was is right. Yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. difficult to get that in your mind or put your thoughts around that situation. What, yeah, what must they have been thinking? You know, I read one number that. Well, one I, thing he was speaking yeah. up against the what was allowed, and uh, it created a lot of interest and concern and probably fear in some is what was going to happen next. Yes. Conviction because the spirit of the Lord is moving. By the way, I meant to tell you, when you see me looking weird like this, looking up, I I've actually got two monitors. I got my computer right here. Then I got y'all up on a big monitor up here. And so when I, like, I got you at the top of the list there, Virginia, right? Which I don't really have any control over that. But for me to look <laughs> at you, I had to lean back like this. <laughs> so, That's good. Yeah. But it, it was, I mean, it was so convicting because they were anticipating Messiah. And they're going, is this the Messiah? And he's saying, no, no, no. But there's one coming after me. The second he says that, they're thinking, what? The forerunner. He's the forerunner. He's the one that's coming. And he's baptizing with water. But there's one that's going to baptize you with the Spirit. So verse nine, in those days, in what days? The days where John was out baptizing in the Jordan. You, you got it, man. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. So Jesus is over there and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Why did Jesus do that? Had he committed a bunch of sins? I heard somebody well, chuckle. I think he was right? fulfilling the desires of, of the father. Now, see that, there you go, Randall, that right there, that's a biggie, that's a biggie, biggie, and so let me just throw this one at you, this helps me so much when I encounter passages like this, and you start thinking about these great questions, and of course, you know, that all we do is we just look at the scripture and ask the uh, reporter questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, you know, you just do that, in John 17, when Jesus is praying to the Father in what we call the high priestly prayer, he says to the Father, you know, Father, I didn't do anything that you didn't tell me to do, and I didn't say anything you didn't tell me to say. Why did Jesus come to John to be baptized? Because the Father told him to. The Father let him. If the Scripture doesn't tell us overtly why or something like that, that is the truth of it, okay? We're not looking for a way out. That is the reality of it. The Father told him to do that. Remember, there's going to be a time in Jesus' life where uh, his brothers say, hey, you're going to the feast? You're going to the festival? And he says, no, no, I'm not going. They leave, and shortly thereafter, he goes. I had somebody ask me this week, was Jesus lying to them? <laughs> no, Jesus wasn't lying to them. The Father hadn't told him to go yet. You know, the, the, he, Jesus is at a big wedding there. His mother comes up to him and says, hey, they run out of wine. You tell right there, it's not a Baptist wedding, right? You can laugh, Okay. And so uh, Jesus says, what do I have to do with that? And then the mom goes off and says, hey, you do whatever he tells you to do. The father had already clued in mom before he told the son to do it. And then he told the son to do it. Okay? Jesus did what the father told him to do. So Jesus came to be baptized. So when you think, well, why is that? Well, let's just read. A lot of times you can discern reasoning when you find out what happened. Verse 10, immediately. Oh, let's back up. Well, that's okay. He's baptized. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw, and I'm reading the New American Standard, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending up on him. So Jesus is baptized. He comes up out of the water. Also, these verses give us little hints as to uh, uh, modes of baptism and things like that. There's all sorts of debate. You don't argue with people. You can talk all day long. You can discuss all you want to, but you don't separate fellowship over such things. He comes up out of the water, and what happens? The dove and the spirit. Yeah. Well, first of all, the heavens are open. In the New American Standard, the heavens are open. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. King James, the heavens are open. Over here, the Lexham. Uh, the Lexham, by the way, is a, an ongoing translation of uh, Lagos Bible software. <coughs> That's like the Mercedes Benz of Bible software. And they have this ongoing translation and it's useful. 
But look what the ESV says. The heavens being torn open. That's a little more graphic than I thought it was in my mind. You know, and I'm not sure, but it seems like I read somewhere. I could be wrong with this. Maybe Rachel can research me here real quick. I think this word for opening right here may be the same word that was used for the veil being torn when Jesus died. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That the but I'm not veil sure. being torn. Yeah, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's a great picture, but don't hold me through that, okay? But anyway, the heavens are open like that. The spirit descends on Jesus like a dove, and a voice comes out of the heavens saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In you, I am well pleased. So why was Jesus baptized? Well, the start the will of the father. Of what now? The will of the father. Is the will of the father. And he's well pleased with him. Rachel says it's the same Greek word. I thought it was. Mm. Boy, does that. Well, I guess he. A little nuance. He met, he met the conditions necessary from the father. And then he started his ministry. Yeah, he, there were some things he wanted to, to communicate right here. And we see part of it here, Mark. Then you see it in the other Gospels. Because uh, here the voice comes from heaven. Jesus hears it. John hears it. It's a declaration that Jesus, you are my beloved son. Jesus knew that. And you, I am well pleased. Jesus knew that. But it is. Now, Jesus is confirmed, affirmed in this way. John sees this. Remember what John's going to say later on. He's going to look at his apostles. He looks over at Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God, because the Father had said to me that the one on whom you see the dove descend upon is the Messiah. Right. And right here, right. he sees it. What happens? What do you think the next word is in verse 12? Take a wild guess. Immediately. 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 <laughs> immediately. immediately. Anyway, uh, yeah, Rachel said that was the same Greek word right there for that torn let that just go through your mind and your spirit, because I think there's some real import there, okay? I don't know what it is, but it's just, it's just resonating with me. Immediately. At this, point, yeah. at this point, there was one thought that I wanted to share. Sure. Um, you know, I never really thought about Jesus. I mean, I mean, to me, Jesus is Jesus on earth, but, you know, there was a point in time where he had always just been in his spirit form. And then we think of the Holy Spirit as always being in the spirit form, but in the cross reference for this verse, uh, and it's, I think, day, I don't know what day, but we looked up Luke 3, uh -huh. 21 and 22, and it says that the way Luke says it is that the Holy Spirit descended upon him, taking on the form of a dove. Yeah. And so, so I mean, so this was the Holy Spirit, who is a spirit you know, uh, you know, taking on physical form, uh, just like Christ was. Yeah. It, it, that is just, uh, how do you describe it? I mean, the word pops in my mind is weird, uh, <laughs> but yeah. well, it's the power. It's the power pre preparing him for his ministry. Well, yeah, the yeah. thing is, it's that it's a mystery is what it really is. I uh, know. Of really the, of the Godhead to start with the father, son, and spirit, mm -hmm. you know, and how, they function in roles as one. Uh, and the best way that we can try to describe it in our English language as three persons, but even that fails when you try to wrap. And that, that's the reason uh, we, we really lose something. The modern translations, all these modern translations that I've had up here have, uh, they don't have the word Godhead in it. King James uses Godhead to describe uh, God. And I think that's a useful term godhead that's father son and spirit and uh when you see it right here the, the cool thing is you see all of them together you see the father in this thing you see the son in this thing you see the spirit and then you see what the son has done uh philippians tells us he took on the form of flesh he took on creation to do what he did for us but we often don't think about the fact that he still has that body he has the resurrected glorified body really the firstborn of those that will be resurrected from the dead. So there's a lot going on right here uh, that shows us uh, that Jesus is getting ready. So the next thing that happens immediately, the spirit does what? You are my beloved son. In verse 12. Drove him out to the wilderness. Yeah, took yeah. him to the wilderness. And in, in, in the King James, it says the spirit driveth him in the wilderness. The new American standard impaled him. The ESV, like the spirit drove him into the wilderness. 
So it's driving him into the wilderness. So I'm going to ask Randall this. Uh -oh. If you are driven, if you're impelled, if somebody drives you, what's the connotation about you in that particular kind of verbiage? Um, it wasn't of my accord, not of, not of my own volition. Oh, I think you just helped me with something. Yeah, yeah it's. Yeah, it's like being drawn. It's like being drawn. You yeah, well, this drawn is, by the spirit. well, it wasn't so much drawn. It's the idea that this wasn't Jesus's idea. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. But when I think of driveth and impelled, I'm thinking resistance on my part. Oh, gotcha. You know, yeah. Yeah. Melanie said not voluntarily. You know, I didn't. Yeah. Want to, but there wasn't that resistance of Jesus because we've already seen that he does what the father wants him to. But it wasn't when you said that, I went, oh, this wasn't of his own volition. This wasn't his idea. Well, we've known that, that this wasn't Jesus' idea. The spirit's leading him, but the spirit's really leading him. I mean, really. Like, this isn't something I would come up with, do. Oh, yeah, okay, I want you to go you mind, out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hanging out there 40 days and 40 nights, you know? Yeah. Uh, whatever that may be. It's just that term was really interesting. So he goes out there. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast and the angels were ministering to him. When you read the other gospels, you obviously get a fuller story with all these accounts. Mark's the only one that mentions the wild beast. Why do you think he mentions wild beast? Huh. Oh, Rachel mentioned that she thought that the original Greek word is a baffling wind that pushing. Wow, that makes it even more interesting, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we know this, that the spirit moves like that. So why do you think that Mark mentions the wild animals? So he has power over creation. Has power over creation? Yep, that he has power. Over A lot of times when we think of wild animals, we're thinking of the uh, lack of safety in an environment. That right. this, you know, things like that. I'm not too sure. And I, I did actually read somebody that mentioned something like this. And I thought I never thought about that this way. That Jesus wasn't totally alone when he was out there. We always think that he's out there 40 days and 40 nights and he was totally alone. Nobody was around. But the wild animals were with him. And I think that wild animals were probably just chilling with him. Yeah, you know, right. Not, you know, that kind of thing, that the wild animals were there. And at the end of the time is when we know from the other gospels, the angels came and ministered to him. Uh, you know, for the longest time, I thought he wasn't tempted until the end of the 40 days. And the, the three temptations that we have were definitely at the end of that 40 days, you know, when he became hungry and this kind of thing. But no, I don't think he was just laying around for 38 or 39 days doing nothing. Are we are we tempted just every 40th day? Yes. Oh, OK. I, I thought I thought since you were in Georgia, <laughs> Randall, that, that, that you would be able to say that. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. No, I, you know, I had somebody say earlier, no, I'm tempted every day. And I went, man, you yeah. are blessed. I'm more on like the every second thing. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, Rachel's the microsecond. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Melanie says it makes you think of angels and lions. And it, with Daniel, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, that type of thing. Uh, he's out there with the wild animals, but it doesn't mean that he's having to dodge the wild animals, I don't think. But he's there with and before the father being tempted, I think for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, that's, that's some things there. So verse 14, Mark pushes the narrative on. He's telling, he wants us to see some things. And remember, Mark doesn't deal so much with the teachings of Jesus, though he does. Um, he shows us what Jesus did, the deeds of the Lord. 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. So I John have a question. Sure. When I read that, that says now after he had been taken into custody, was there a significance to John having to be in custody before Jesus entered? What do you think? And this is Carol talking, but I don't see Carol on my screen. Where are you? I'm below Rachel on mine, but I don't know where I'm on yours. Yeah, I know what you mean. I want to change the way. He's wow. above. What's his name? Randall. Oh, there she is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there she is. Thank you. Uh, so uh, somebody answer a question right there. And if you don't do it, I'm going to call on Rachel or something like that. What was the question? Uh, state the question again, Carol. Was there any significance to the fact that John had to be put into prison before Jesus entered? So it says right here that now when John's arrested, 
read it again. Now, after John had been taken into custody, now, that, that's just sort of maybe a historical statement. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. The Bible actually answers your question. Thank you, Ari. What do y'all think? Remember when John said this? There you go. There you go, Donna. John stated he must decrease and Jesus must increase. Yeah, and there was a time, wasn't there a time when they were overlap, overlapping and there was a question about Jesus' disciples versus John's disciples? But you would think after a while he should decrease and get out of the way so that Jesus could continue on. Yeah. Right? Because he was to prepare the path and then Jesus. Yeah. Continue and so on, you had so. this period of time, which was, I think, very brief. Because, like I said, well, I go, Jesus looks at him and says, I mean, John looks at Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. And then John's disciples started following Jesus. I think Andrew was the first one. You actually see some of this in the other Gospels. Mark, uh, the stuff that we're about to see right here where Jesus called the disciples, that's actually the second year of Jesus' three years ministry. Mark begins like at the second year year right there with that part and uh, john is the one that gives us more insight of what led up to that but uh so there was that period of time john says no 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 you you must go to him and so it was a very brief period of time and it's not like they were fighting for the disciples or anything like that you know right and then john winds up getting arrested and everything and you remember why he got arrested right i think you read a little bit about that this week so uh, anyway jesus comes and he's preaching the gospel of god now, what's the gospel of god well, he says right here in verse 15, the time is fulfilled. Somebody said that while ago. Rachel did. I see Rachel says here, uh, yeah, the way is written. You think the brothers just left without knowing anything about Jesus, but they knew what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. Hang on with that. Just a second. You're absolutely right. Jesus says this, the time is fulfilled. What time? The kingdom of God. Oh, it's the time is fulfilled and the kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. the gospel yeah it's the time of the old covenant the time that the prophets have been speaking of of the one that would be uh yeshua hamashiach the messiah would come that the time is now john had been saying repent and be baptized for forgiveness of sin jesus is saying repent and do what most powerful word you're going to see in the new testament believe believe mm -hmm. believe you know, when we're challenged with not understanding this, not understanding that, wondering about this, enemy sends those fiery darts where you feel so stupid and all this kind of stuff. God and Jesus don't ask us to, to worry about that. They say, believe. So if and John we Hagee say, says, John Hagee says it's more than believe, it's obey. Well, it, it's, it's, but it's a, a different type of believing because even the demons do what? Believe. 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 At least they have good sense to shudder it's believing loyalty yes there's obedience in that but when you say obedience it's like adding something to the belief and you don't want to do that it's believing it's who are you loyal to your belief is in jesus and the most high god and you're loyal to them so what you said was that you terry yeah. oh i was going to just say that you said the time is fulfilled and then you said the old covenant the old covenant, it, I mean, he came to fulfill the old covenant. Mm -hmm. So is that the word that you would put there? The old covenant was fulfilled? Uh, he was the only one who could do it. Yes. And as in everything, as we see, there's a process to it. Okay. There's a process in even, because what does Jesus say later on? I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill okay. it fulfill the law it's a new uh new dispensation of truth it's a new era a new well it's a, a new... fulfillment of what's being brought before the, the time right. of the prophets was being fulfilled in in the uh the expectation of messiah now there's other things of the prophets that have been yet to, yet to be fulfilled right. okay? there's other things there that part of it has been fulfilled but there's other things that haven't been fulfilled there's i think been i've some... heard it i think i've heard it said it's a shadow of what is to come yeah on certain things there's uh, typological things there's foreshadowings of things yeah right so what it's, jesus is proclaiming he's saying what hey the time is fulfilled the kingdom of god is at hand 
Jesus used that kind of phrase all the time. He would look at somebody and say, hey, you're close to the kingdom right now. You're close to the kingdom. What's he saying? You repent and you believe in the gospel. What was the gospel? What was the good news that Jesus is talking about? Okay. Yeah. The kingdom of God has come. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the kingdom. It's the kingdom. Yeah. And uh, that of forgiveness. Yeah. All the things that he's going to be expressing and talking about in the kingdom. Too often, though, we as believers, we sit there and we want to quote 1 Corinthians 15. We want to law, law to say, oh, Jesus was preaching the death, burial, and resurrection because that's how the gospel is defined. No, that's not what Jesus, he was preaching the kingdom of God. Now, he did start saying some things about that in the last few months with his disciples, you know. So let's press on. Hey, hey y'all do forgive me. We're going to go a little longer than normal. I usually try to shoot for an hour, but uh, I'm not that locked into it. But, you know, we had the housekeeping to take care of tonight. And this is good stuff. I mean, just so yep. much stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So here he comes. He was going along to see a Galilee, verse 16. He saw Simon and Andrew and the brother of Simon casting a net in the sea. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately, they <laughs> left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, men in the nets. Immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired servants. And they went away to follow him. Now, Rachel, you said something about that a while ago. What was it? See, there it is. What were you thinking when you said that? Well, in the past, I've always thought, um, like you mentioned before, that, well, that's um, pretty amazing that they just knew about Jesus and knew what they were getting into and just immediately dropped everything. But then uh, I found out, like what you'd said, that there was a time difference here that, that they would have heard about Jesus, would have heard probably being in the crowd when he was talking and preaching and so this must have been um like the uh, process of coming to the decision when he said follow me they're like yes this is it and and dropped because yeah i think there's a process that we go through before we actually drop everything and go and follow him yeah yeah uh yeah i, I was like you i thought for years and years that these were co what we call cold calls you know, he just mm -hmm. appeared out of nowhere, come and follow me. And they go, oh, yes, yes, yes. And they throw everything down. I've actually heard it preached and taught that way. Y'all have to remember, we are in the middle of the, of the Bible Belt of the world. I mean, literally. So you'll hear a lot of things. And but that's not true. They, they had had mm -hmm. encounters. They knew. And then, you know, you, I've heard for years and years that these were just poor fishermen. These were not poor fishermen. These were businessmen. They had boats. They had hired servants. They, they were it's generational businesses that they left dad with the business. And then when Peter is all said and done, Jesus is resurrected. They don't know what to do. What did Peter do? He goes back fishing. He goes back to the boats. Nothing wrong with that. You know? But Jesus comes and he says, follow me. And particularly in that day and that time, they knew what was being said. Come and be a part of me. Come be a part of what I'm doing. They did it. They left and walked away. Verse 21, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. So what does Jesus do on the Sabbath? He's a good Jewish boy. He goes where? I'm in the synagogue. Goes in the synagogue. What's a synagogue? A meeting place. A place meeting of place? worship. Place of worship. Anybody else? You know, a lot of times you'll get confused synagogues and the temple. It's only one temple. Okay. But synagogues was a meeting place, but a place of learning. Melanie says, I learned something new this week. Y'all want to learn, hear what I learned? Absolutely. Yeah. A synagogue, originally the term referred to the people, the group of people that were meeting. And then it eventually morphed into referring to the building. So like a church. I was about to say, does that sound familiar to any of y'all? It sure does, doesn't it? Sure does. Yes. I said, when I saw that, I thought, there's nothing new. <laughs> there's nothing new. Yeah, because you don't want to know what Rachel and I think about buildings. <clears throat> Here's what I think about buildings. I love buildings. They keep you dry. <laughs> they oh keep you God. comfortable. Mm -hmm. They're a great place to meet. Okay. We're all sitting in some form of a building right now. They are the blessing of the most high God. But I try really, 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 really hard. And I'm not always successful. But I try really hard not to say I'm going to church mm -hmm. because I know that I am the church. 
Right. We are the church. Right now, we are being the church. Right. Probably in, uh, in, more, in a more biblical way than what I do most of the time. Right. You know? Sadly. And so, mm -hmm. and yeah, it is. It's a sad thing. And so, uh, you know, you try to teach that. But even more than that, you try to live it and you try to manifest it and you try to show it and you try to do things. And but I just found that intriguing that the synagogue used to refer to the people then became a reference to the building. And I went, well, there we go. One of the things, Dale, that I read, yes, it said that up until the destruction of the temple, mm -hmm. uh, the synagogue was a place where uh, of Jewish study and learning. The rabbis taught yeah. uh, religious texts. And so that's basically what Jesus was doing. He was walking in and teaching. Well, yeah, and this ought to be endearing to you is basically the local library. Exactly. <laughs> Carol works in the library. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's that same type of thing. Uh, but just the fact that it went from re being the people to being a physical entity. Uh, the strategies of Satan. Got to be aware of them, right? So they were amazed. Jesus gets up and teaches. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So tell me, you've read all this. You've looked at it. How was he teaching them as one having authority? What was the difference? He was the word. Okay. It really helps if you are the word and mm -hmm. you wrote the word. Right. Okay. I said, one of the he things is that... the word. I said, what? He is the word. Well, he is the word. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Terry. One of the things that I saw that I'd never seen before was, again, the cross reference, uh -huh. Luke 4, 14 to 19, and it's in day three. Uh, Jesus returned to Galilee. I'm paraphrasing. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit on the Sabbath. He went to the synagogue as, he was, as was his custom, and he stood up and read Isaiah, which was handed to him. Yep. <laughs> and so it was, it was like, evidence of i mean it's just the sovereignty of god yep because they opened that scroll and it was at the point of uh, isaiah 61 and he stood up and he read and he stopped right in the middle of the sentence because he stopped at the point of what he was going to do when he came the first time the rest of the sentence will be fulfilled when he comes the next time I mean, it's a great little thing in isaiah right there so he he's reading with authority he's speaking with authority but what, what does that mean? What, was he doing something that made them think that he had authority or what? There's something about oh, when you hear people talk, especially if you're a Christian or maybe more mature, maybe even young, that there's a life with those words. There's, there's something given to those words that give it life, okay. give it depth, yeah. give it yeah. meaning. It's it just appeals to people, yeah. even yourself, when you listen to someone who may tell you about golf and they don't know anything about golf and someone who's experienced golfer, there's just a life and experience or something more behind the words. And you pay attention to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it boils down to this, even for us, uh, let's see what Melanie said, familiarity or intimate knowledge of the word or connectedness. Yeah. That all goes what I'm about to say. Jesus actually believed it. See, that's what happens with us when we know it and we actually believe it and we speak it and we share it with people. They can discern that difference. Many of us, we've all heard teachings or preachings or whatever, where you're sitting there going, somebody's just reading something, rattling something off, and it's just like dead fish, you know? Right. And that's what the scribes were doing right there. But you know what? As they say here in the States, but wait, there's more. Okay. Look at this. While he's teaching, just then, another term, uh, term of timing, while he's teaching, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Wait a minute. Are you telling me there's a participant in a religious service here in the synagogue that has a demon? Can that happen? Yes. 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 As a matter of fact, a friend of mine in the first class, we were actually at a church together years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago in South Florida. And we've actually had worship services Thank where we were Lord. praising it and worship yeah. God. And all of a sudden some demon would throw somebody down and put on a show and this kind of stuff. And cause that's what demons like to do. They like to try to embarrass the person. So as we get into this, I'll, let me say this before I forget it. Remember this. It's not the person. 
It's not the person. It's the demon. It's not the person. That person is fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139. And it's a creature of the most high God. And God loves them as much as he loves you. Okay. And so uh, we've actually seen that kind of thing happen. So here's Jesus is he's preaching. A demon starts manifesting himself inside this man. He cries out. And here's what the demon says. Now, the demon is using the man's voice. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? <laughs> That's a little intimate thing, isn't it? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. Hey, what would happen in most churches if that happened today? Throw them out. <laughs> Throw them out? In most of the churches I've been a part of around, most people would go running out and leave him laying there. <laughs> <laughs> or at best, look for somebody with a tranquilizer gun. <laughs> totally unaware of what God wants us to do. Jesus gives us an example right here. Look what Jesus does. Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. You see Jesus doing this a lot with the demons. He doesn't need the confirmation and the affirmation of demons to let people know who he is. As a matter of fact, he doesn't want to be associated with it at all, right? And he demanded and commanded, come out of him. He did it by the word. He didn't do it by in the way that the exercisers of the day did it. And you, if you want to do a little interesting side study, uh, just go uh, study Jewish exorcism some. And it still occurs today. That's what, you know, Kabbalah and things like that. Uh, they had all sorts of uh, things up here. <laughs> what are y'all two doing? Terry, who is that sitting next to you? Do you know her? This is Rose. Hey, Rose. So y'all y'all know each other? Yeah, I do a lot of preceptors. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, no, they didn't. They would do things to make people manifest them. Like they would uh, shove their ring with certain type of uh, incense and things on people's noses to where they would sneeze, and then they would declare that the demon came out <laughs> because they sneeze. There's nothing new. You can turn on the TV and see the same kind of stuff. Okay. Jesus just said, by word, come out. Well, let me tell you what. The demons are always going to put on a show. Okay. And this poor man, they throw him into a convulsion. This demon does. The unclean spirit does. Cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed. So they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. See the same phraseology there? He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. He had authority of unclean spirit. Folks, this is where we are as the body of Christ. I said, uh, uh, what I do, I, uh, I do a lot of stuff. I teach piano lessons, as I pointed out. While I, go, I teach Bible studies. Uh, I lead worship at a church, a part-time job at a church. And wonderful lovely people just love them to death a lot of them in the first class a while ago uh they're a methodist church and so they're going through this split right now and they've got a crazy worship leader that just happens to believe that whatever the bible says is true mm -hmm. you know and um and they're beginning to see some things and they're beginning to understand some things so when i say some of this stuff it's because i'm in sort of that kind of environment all the time and so they're, they're really sort of struggling because we need to do something uh, to get young people coming in. We need to do something to get the church to grow. We need to do this. And I always say, uh, do you notice what Jesus did right there? If you teach the word of God, if you will live and manifest the power and presence of the most high God, you're not going to have to worry about trying to be attractive. Amen. You're not going to have to worry about trying to get people to come. You don't have... Because what you see in the pattern of Jesus, you see it at the end of this chapter right here. One guy didn't do what Jesus told him to do. And because of that, Jesus couldn't hang out in the cities anymore. He had to hang out in the wilderness. And the people came to him because they wanted to experience the power of God. They wanted to be set free of diseases. They wanted to be set free of demons. They don't want to be religiously massaged. 
uh, I get this question all the time. The people say, well, if we do this and do this, will young people come? And my answer is usually this, why would they? Why would they? You know, if we do this and do this, is somebody going to come to church? And I tell them, quit, quit, quit the come to church stuff. Quit that. If you feel like somebody needs to come to church and you're standing there talking to them, you are the image bearer of the most high God. You right. proclaim the kingdom to them right now. I don't want to hear you talking about, oh, you got to come hear my pastor or you got to come hear my worship leader. You got to come here. Really? Give me a break. What they need is an encounter with the most high God. And you are that vessel in their face right now. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. And most people can sit there and go, uh, uh, but you know, I lay it right at the feet of leadership. I lay it at my feet because we teach into that kind of thing. And we lead into that kind of thing. We don't do what we've seen in Ephesians 4, what we're supposed to be doing, equipping the saints for the work of the service of the kingdom. And where it says that the body will build itself up in love if we're each one functioning the way that we're supposed to. And so, you know, yeah, go ahead. You know that, you know that verse you said about uh, greater things you will do? Yeah, yeah, John 14. We think, we think about healing and casting out. But I think the first thing I thought of was the authority. Is that, I mean, you know, I, I don't know that, I don't know that we're going to have more authority than Christ, but I know we don't have as much authority as believers today as we should. I think that we have the complete total authority of the most high God within every true believer. We just don't move within it. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know how to use it. We don't appropriate it. We don't, we quench it and we don't do it intentionally. Okay. And the greater, when it says in John 14, 12, there, and even greater things you will do, it's just simply because Jesus was one corporeal at that time body and couldn't be everywhere. Right now, with the body of Christ, we can do even greater in numbers if we live this way and do this way. Rachel says something. Oh, Donna said hallelujah. There we go, Donna. Yes, I feel so strongly that we're being called to take authority over the area where God has planted us. Take your street and pray over it every day. See, that's a great thing. We moved into a new place. We've been here about a year now. We live in this little apartment, and there's eight apartments right here. And there's a road right here. This, uh, if you walk all the way, it's a long driveway. If you walk down this way and back up, back, it's two tenths of a mile. So I go out here every day and I walk back and forth, back and forth. Why do I walk? Because I'm getting old and you fight, right? <laughs> you do the little exercise you can do. And what am I doing? I'm praying yes. for these praying for these eight little apartments right here a lot of times i go downtown we have a lovely little downtown area and when we first uh, i was born and raised around here but then i was gone for 20 years when i came back particularly that first year i would go down probably once a week at least once or twice a week and just walk around downtown and just pray blessings over the businesses play uh pray for authority over some things uh pray against and you know what i mean by that certain things that I saw, you know, mm -hmm. and just pray, just walk around and pray. That is, you know, when Jesus said that, that Matthew 28 thing, as you are going, you know, not just when you show up at church. Yeah. Uh, Rachel says, yes, there's a reason why we're in the street. It is every believer prayed over there. And boy, if y'all want to hear a great story sometime, drop a note to Rachel about how God led them to where they live right now in that house. Uh, maybe we'll have time for that one night, Rachel. Just a great just just a move of god um what he did there so here we go uh jesus has got a great teaching you got a demon that interrupts him jesus says hey come out of here they're amazed because he commands unclean spirits and they obey him oh one last thought on this because we're going to see this a lot all the way through here you have the power and the authority to command the unclean spirit to leave somebody don't you think though that we need that, uh, like it in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, where He says severally as He wills. When you're in a position, you have to sense or uh, uh, the Holy Spirit leading you. It's not of yourself; it's of the Holy Spirit working through you from God the Father through you, the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we decide on our human part just to do because we're taught this. It's to me, it's a little deeper. It's listening to the spirit and the timing. If this is something you should do or shouldn't do. Okay. It's I know what you're the saying. Spirit doing it through you at a certain time. No, no. I know what you're saying, but let me take another step beyond that. 
Okay. We as believers have the spirit within us at all times. Right. But I mean, you don't, you don't choose. You just don't go up and choose. Oh, this got a demon. I'm going to do this. It's, it's like a, a, a knowing and awareness made by the spirit that this is something for him to work through you, for him to accomplish through yeah. you. And, but the thing is, it's always with you, but he's the one whom, who's the motivator. He's the one who's choosing. He's the one guiding. He's the one leading. Absolutely. And everybody would agree with that. But there is no doubt whatsoever that is, you don't do this of your own volition, of your own flesh. You know, I can't. Right. You don't just flesh. decide to go out. But today and- here's what I had decided. Here's what okay. I do determine. And you do this ahead of time. You do this in the spirit. If I'm going along and all of a sudden somebody manifests a, a demon. Okay, I've had this happen. I'll give you an example. Uh, for 17 years, I met at a, a local, um, it's not a retirement home, but it's sort of a retirement home where folks, they retire and they live in little apartments. It's not assisted living, but they have people that will help them. And so we had a group of 25 people and there was this lady and there were some younger people there that had uh, like head trauma injuries. They could live by themselves, but they needed a little help. And there was this one lady that I'd seen various things that happened just from time to time. I thought, I wonder what that is. Well, one night, uh, I looked at her and all of a sudden she just looked different and then she just collapsed. And I went, it made me mad. Okay. Cause I went, I knew what that was. That's a demon, but I've got two dozen, what I'll call little old folks. They're like my age and older now. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you don't want to freak them out. Are they all going, Oh, call an ambulance, call an ambulance. Got no, no, stop, 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 stop. I said, yucks back away a little bit. She's laying there. And it's not her fault. It's not her. She's not messing with me. Sometimes people want to mess with you, you know. And I just went over and whispered. I said, you leave her alone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't stand up and proclaim, you know. No. Right. Just leave her alone and get out of here. Within a minute or so, she sat up. She's fine. What happened? I said, you're okay. You're all right. You don't need an ambulance. No, you don't need anything like that. <laughs> but I don't want to sit there and say, Okay, God, I'm not sure if I'm ready. I'm supposed to No, you are the vessel right there that's empowered by the most high God. If it presents it itself right there, then you do it. Where are the body of believers when some evil is going along? Oh, K. Arthur's got it. I'll give you the gist of this story. There's some friend of K. Arthur's that was at a, uh, she tells the story all the time, that uh, was at a, a dress shop and a guy comes in to rob it start with you robbing a dress shop yeah don it's being ready in, in season out of season she's actually in the changing room this guy comes in and he's got a knife and he's attacking people this happened in chattanooga and um cut a couple people and they're all trying to get out he gets in there and he swipes at her and cuts her on the face something like that and she just commands him, in the name of the lord jesus christ leave me alone leave us alone he does what freaks out yeah. takes off running they arrest him he winds up being convicted winds up being incarcerated winds up getting saved in jail mm-hmm. winds up coming back and meeting her and they've actually sort of hit the trail and gone out and testified in churches that it just so happened that the very top 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 surgeon in all the state of tennessee was in chattanooga that day the guy that could take care of that cut to where you can't even see it anymore mm-hmm. You know, but what did she do? She stood firm in the Lord in season, out of season, prepared, ready at this moment, because was Jesus expecting this guy to manifest at that moment? Probably not. Yeah. But here it is. Here we go. So let me press on. Otherwise, uh, we'll be here all night. And and I do have uh, Mondays and Tuesdays are fun. Uh, Where are we right? Oh, verse uh, 28 immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. You reckon? And folks, this is before social media. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Now, what day is it, by the way? What day of the week is it? Sabbath. Sabbath. Saturday, Sabbath. So they come out of the synagogue and they go into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. What does that tell you about where Simon lived? By the synagogue? Pretty close. He's within a Sabbath day walk of the synagogue. And you know how they were. They have determined how far it was. I don't remember how far it is. I want to say like half a mile or two-thirds of a mile is all they could walk on the Sabbath. This this comes into play in just a minute. 
Now, Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. They came to Jesus, hey, she's sick. Jesus came to her, raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left, and she waited on them. Go fix us some supper there, mama. The fever left because Jesus said what? Touched her, raised her up, fever left. We know today that fever is what? It's a symptom of something being wrong. Can be a sickness, can be a disease, can be a demon, can be anything like it. So he heals her. Verse 32, when evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. Why in evening? Why after the sun set? So they weren't seen. Sabbath was over. Yeah. The Sabbath was over. It's no longer the Sabbath. Yeah. And remember what we just read a couple of verses before. It said that the news went out through all of Galilee. This is before you had telephone. This is before you had all that stuff. That Everybody was saying within that Sabbath day walk what had happened. And the news had gone out what had happened in that one particular synagogue. The sun goes down and immediately they weren't waiting to daylight. They do what? They're bringing those who are ill and those who are demon possessed. And the whole city gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. It was nighttime and he's doing this. We don't know how long it went. We don't even know if Jesus really got to go to sleep because what's the next verse say right there? Look at it. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. So if he did go to bed, let's say he went to bed at midnight, he's up at four 30 or five. It's still dark. He gets up and he goes and prays. Why does he get up and go and pray? Fellowship. Fellowship with the father. And I always want to know, what did he pray? What did he pray? Mm. Rachel said he needed to talk to dad. Here you are. You're totally human and you're totally God. And you're talking to the father. What is the conversation? No doubt. <laughs> Probably a larger thing here. We'll see it later on in the things. Remember when the woman sneaks up behind Jesus and touches the hem of his garment and, uh, Hey, y'all want to see my wife? Come here, wife. <laughs> no, she just said, Come here, woman. <laughs> she says, no, I, I think she's about to go to bed. Hang on a second. What? Yeah. Okay. Are you, are you almost done? I said, I think I am. I'm not sure. Like I said, we normally won't go this long. But my goodness. This is the beloved yeah. the woman. <laughs> um, I think woman. it's not so much <laughs> what he said. It's the fact that he's rejuvenated by the presence of the father. The good remember, one. Yeah. Remember with the woman when he. He said, I feel virtue came from me. Power went out from me. Mm -hmm. Literally, power would go out from Jesus. And you've probably had that if you've ever shared with somebody, if you talk with somebody, if you teach or preach or you lead words, something like that. Power will go out from you. Now, watch what happens here. He's there praying. Simon and his companions search for him. They found him. And they said, hey, everybody's looking for you. How did Jesus receive that everybody's looking for you lick right there? Rachel said that they're thankful all the people healed Jesus' father talking about it. Isn't that great? Yeah. Jesus said, let's get out of here. See, he, he, he wasn't interested in all this thing about, you know, everybody's looking for you. They want to see you do more things. There's more people. No, he wasn't having anything to do with it. Verse 38, he said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. See, he's not going to get caught up in this thing of what people think about him. He knows he's going to have a problem with this, which he did when they wanted to make him king, right? And all this kind of stuff later on. He says, no, let's keep pressing on. Let's keep doing this. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Is that not one of the greatest declarations of faith right there? If you're willing... You can do this. You know, I believe you can do this, but it's up to you. Lord, if you're willing. Now watch this. Verse 41, New American Standard. 
moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing be clean, be cleansed. Why was it significant that Jesus touched this guy? Well, he showed a lot of humility, I think. Oh, yeah, no doubt. There's healings leper. everywhere. I'm it's sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It's because he was a leper and you didn't touch lepers. They were unclean. Yeah, like that's the ultimate unclean that you don't touch is a leper. And Jesus touched it. Sometimes, uh, I say this all the time because I haven't found one yet. Jesus never healed the same way twice. Sometimes you see him speaking the word. Sometimes you see him making mud. Sometimes you see him touching. And he usually does it in a way that I never would have done it. The one that I would have spoken the word over would have been the leopard. Jesus touches him, <laughs> right? So uh, Rachel says, Jesus first coming to heal the bounds. I wonder with the second coming, will there be an outpouring of healing, et cetera? Woo. We'll talk about that as we go along, because you see this all the way through Mark. You see this. And this is actually kind of like a, one way of looking at when, uh, when you don't know, you know, should I, should I get involved? Should I, uh -huh. should I pray? You know, should I, whatever. And, and, you know, it's, it's kind of simple. It's kind of like, uh, if you're willing and Jesus says, I am willing, you know, so I am willing. He says, I will do it immediately. The leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Watch this appear real quick. Verse 41 moved with compassion over here. ESB moves with pity the lexum and becoming angry. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing <laughs> be made clean. <laughs> Does that give a different nuance and feel to it? Jesus, yeah. he wasn't angry with the man. Anything, you know, and when you look at that word, it literally means uh, just a movement from within the bowels, compassion, just from the depth. And it can be translated that way. And I thought, man, that's, an, that's interesting right there. Last few verses here will be done. <clears throat> and he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And Jesus said to him, <coughs> excuse me, guys, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. He's saying, hey, go back and do what the law said for someone that has been healed from leprosy. And you go back and there's all these little details. Okay, go back and do that. Verse 45, but this guy goes out and begins to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus, the, the news right there, the gospel, that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. The word had gone out. They were coming to him from everywhere. Well, anyway, we'll stop out right there, guys. Like I said, usually we won't go this long, but first night, long chapter. And I thank you for your patience. So if you've got any questions, uh, you know, fire them to me. Y'all know where to find me. Uh, you go to my website. I'm all over social media. I'm everywhere. And so uh, keep the dialogue going on everything and do what the scripture says, study to show yourself approved. Uh, so uh, Rachel, would you mind praying for us this evening as we bring everything to the close? Sure. Thank you. Father, we just thank you so much that we can gather together and just learn from Mark. And we just thank you that you indwell us, that your life is in us and um, what Jesus did um, you can move in us to do as well. And Father, just help us to walk around this week with eyes wide open. Let us see um, the heavens open. Let us see what's behind the veil. Let us see the unseen and give us the courage to step forward and move as your spirit moves. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Bless y'all. It's so good to meet everybody. We'll see Amen. you next week. Okay. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank bye -bye. you guys. Nice meeting you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. I can't see you guys. I can see her. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I rose. I can hear her too. I can hear her too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, goodness gracious. That's right. Whenever you're, whenever you're in front of a mic, I always assume that it's on, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. So good to meet y'all guys. We'll see you next Tell time. Tell your wife hello. I will. I will. See yeah. y'all later.